This is the National Broadcasting Company, Town Manning speaking. From Cooperstown, New York, the birthplace of baseball. The National Broadcasting Company brings you the baseball centennial ceremonies, which officially dedicate the National Baseball Museum and the Baseball Hall of Fame. Baseball was invented here in Cooperstown, a slumbering little village in upstate New York, 100 years ago. And scores of notables, players of past and present, officials and executives, and thousands of baseball fans are gathered to honor Abner Doubleday, also the game which has become our national pastime. Directly before us, in the heart of this lovely little village of 3,000 population is the National Baseball Museum. It is a simple, beautiful, colonial structure of brick. It's three stories high. Inside it are priceless relics of a thousand memorable games and the men who played them. A short distance away is baseball's first playing field, where young Abner Doubleday laid out the first baseball diamond and established the first set of rules 100 years ago. On a platform in front of the museum, are gathered many of the leaders of modern baseball. There is Judge Kenneshaw Martin Landis, High Commissioner of Baseball, William Herridge, President of the American League, Ford Frick, President of the National League, William G. Bramham, President of the National Association of Professional Baseball Leagues, John A. Heidler, former President of the National League, Postmaster General Honorable James Farley, Governor John K. Tenner, former President of the National League and others, and there also is Charles Doyle. He is president of the Baseball Writers Association, the organization which votes select the members of the Baseball Hall of Fame. We take you now, without further ado, to the speaker's platform where Charles Doyle will serve as master of ceremony. Baseball. Today in Cooperstown, home of baseball, we gather in reverence to baseball's immortals, living and dead. This is the centennial of baseball. One hundred years ago, in this same village, Abner Doubleday invented this thrilling game. Now, for the first time, his achievement is to be officially honored. On the platform here, in front of the National Baseball Museum are some of the present great names of baseball. Gathered about by the thousands are times people and visitors from far and near, friends of baseball, lovers of this great American sport. And all around, perhaps even as far as the voice of radio can reach, hovers the spirit of baseball. A game well played, a lesson learned, a lot Retrieve, defeat, sustain gallantly. And now, it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you the Honorable Rowan D. Spraker, Mayor of Cooperstown, Mr. Spraker. <laughs> Judge Landis and friends of baseball everywhere, welcome to Cooperstown. We in Cooperstown have long been proud of the fact that baseball was originated here. And we are happy that the rest of the United States is being told about it during this centennial year. To those of you present here today, we hope you like our village. We hope the National Baseball Museum and Double Field, which we build in pride, will be as thrilling to you as they are to us. To those of you listening in, we extend a cordial invitation to visit Cooperstown, the cradle of baseball. A few hundred yards from the spot at which I now stand is the lovely peaceful lake, Otsego Lake. Two hundred years ago, the Indians, 
chiefs of the five nations used to gather for council. It is known as Otsego Rock, and the word Otsego is said to be a compound which conveys the idea of a spot at which meetings were held. Today, as mayor of Kurdistan, I ask you all to remember that word Otsego, where meetings were held and meet with us here in Kurdistan during 1939. Thank you, Mayor Spreaker. Before Commissioner Kennesaw M. Landis officially dedicates the National Baseball Museum and the Hall of Fame, we have the privilege of presenting to you the father of the baseball centennial celebration, the man who conceived the idea of a great year-long baseball birthday party. He is John A. Heidler, chairman of the executive committee and former president of the National League. Mr. Heidler will introduce Judge Landis. And here is Honest John Heidler, folks. Yeah. After 20 years of planning, this is indeed the happy consummation of a grand baseball ideal. For all of us closely associated with the game, this will ever be a proud day. For me especially, these are the happiest moments of nearly half a century of efficient service with the old parent National League. No national institution during its first hundred years has so gallantly surmounted obstacles as has our game of baseball. It has followed our flag to war and into peace. It has met keen competition for many other sports. It has kept step with our country's progress and with that long era of inventions which have changed our mode of national life. For all of these it has come and has grown in added stature and dignity as our national game. I wish to pay a word of tribute to the public spirit of citizens of this historic village and to the generous interest and support of Mr. Clark, who have cooperated in making this event an outstanding success. To President Frick and Harridge of the Major Leagues and to Judge Graham, Chief of all the Minor Leagues, I wish to express the appreciation of all of us so-called old-timers on making this hundredth year the best of all. And now I have the pleasure to introduce to you a man I'm sure you all know, the man who for the past 20 years has been the respected and honored one-man Supreme Court of Baseball, Judge Landis. Mr. Hydra, ladies and gentlemen, it gives me a great deal of pleasure to be present at the dedication of the National Baseball Museum and the Baseball Hall of Fame. Since for a hundred years this game has lived and thrived and spread all over our country and a large part of the world, it is fitting that it should have a museum, a national museum. And nowhere else than at its birthplace could this museum be appropriately situated. To the 13 pioneers who were the moving spirits of the game in its infancy, and to the 12 players who've been nominated to the Hall of Fame by the Baseball Writers Association, we pay tribute, just tribute. But I should like, and I think all these immortals of baseball would agree with me, I should like to dedicate this museum to all America, to lovers of good sportsmanship, healthy body, keen mind, for those are the principles of baseball. So it is to them, rather than to the few who have been honored here, that I propose to dedicate this shrine of sportsmanship. And now into the hands of Ford Frick, president of the National League, William Harris, president of the American League, and William G. Bramman, president of the National Association of Professional Baseball Leagues, I now have the privilege and the honor of cutting the ribbon across the door. Ladies and gentlemen, at the moment, Judge Landis 
Boyd Frick, Will Herridge, Mr. Barnum, Chairman Leaders of the Cooperstown Centennial Committee are leaving the platform. They're walking now to the door of the museum. We're going to try to pick up the uh, sound of the shears that is now in the hand of President Ford Frick of the National League. Listen very closely. National League of Professional Baseball Clubs, which I have the honor to represent, considers it a great pride and privilege to assist in the opening of this National Baseball Museum. Ford Frick passes the scissors to President Will Harridge. I have the honor to present and take great pleasure in opening this museum on behalf of the American League. President Branham is next. In behalf of the National Association of Professional Baseball Leagues, representing 41 leagues and 284 clubs in the United States and Canada, it gives me pleasure to participate in the official dedication of the National Baseball Museum. There you are, ladies and gentlemen, we're standing right at the door of the museum, and now the red, white, and blue ribbons have been cut, and the doors are open now for the first time uh, through the public. This beautiful museum, and here is Judge Landis for just a moment. The key is going to the door. Listen. Hard, Judge. <laughs> there it is. And ladies and gentlemen, Judge Landis walks in the door first. We're walking right in with the microphone. Well, what, Judge, this is as far as we can get, I believe. What do you think, Judge? Well, you've done a fine job. <laughs> Worth your while. Ladies and gentlemen, Judge Lannis was the first to enter the door. The National Bro uh, Broadcasting Company microphone was right at his shoulder, second in. The judge looked around in amazement, and then he's walking right out. He stopped to shake hands uh, with uh, one of the ladies here of Cooperstown, and we're unable to uh, get the judge back. He's being sort of mobbed here by the photographers and so forth. A uh, veritable million of photographers are standing here getting the shot that you'll see in your favorite newspaper tomorrow. And now they're finally extricating Judge Landis from the uh, pulling of the spectators, and he's going back to his place on the platform, and I believe now that we're just about ready to go back to the uh, speaker's roster, man, Mr. Doyle. We now pay honor to the members of the Baseball Hall of Fame, great players and great sportsmen of the past and present. First, the 13 pioneers of baseball, selected by a joint committee of the major leagues. Adrian C. Pop Anson, first baseman and manager of the Chicago Nationals for 21 years. Morgan J. Barkley, first president of the National League. Alexander J. Cartwright, organizer of the Knickerbockers, first baseball club in 1845 in New York. Henry Chadwick, inventor of the box score, baseball writer for half a century. Charles A. Comiskey, the old woman, first baseman and owner of the Chicago White Sox. William Arthur Cummings, curveball inventor in 1867 and pitcher for the Brooklyn Stars. William Buck Ewing, catcher for the New York Giants and manager of Cincinnati. In Byron Band Croft Johnson, organizer of the American League and its president from 1901 to 1927. John J. McGraw, third baseman, Baltimore Orioles, manager of the New York Giants for 30 years, winning 10 pennants and three World Series. Charles Old Hart, Redburn, pitcher with the Providence, Boston, and Cincinnati Club. Albert G. Spalding, pitcher, Rockford, Illinois, Boston, and Chicago. George Wright, star of the first professional team, the Cincinnati Red Stockings of 1869. Great shortstop and captain of Boston in, in the National League. And Cornelius A. McGillicuddy. Connie Mack. Manager of the Philadelphia... Gentlemen, the privilege, the priceless privilege of being the first to walk out of the Hall of Museum of Baseball is Connie Mack. And now he's in front of the microphone. Connie Mack was manager of the Philadelphia Athletics since 1909, winning nine pennants and five World Series. Connie Mack, folks. Yeah, want uh, to express my appreciation 
to the people of Cooperstown, New York, for having uh, the game of baseball started here uh, in uh, this uh, town of Cooperstown by the Major General uh, Abner Doubleday. I want to express my sincere thanks for having uh, my name enrolled uh, with the other great uh, stars of baseball and with all of those who have taken part in uh, promoting the interest of baseball for the past uh, hundred years. And I am quite positive that in the years to come that uh, we can look forward to our game still progressing due to the fact that we have uh, the Honorable Mr. Branham at the head of the National Association of Baseball as well as Mr. Ford Frick of the National League and Mr. William Harridge of the American League. And above all, we have uh, that great and honorable Kennesaw M. Landis, the Commissioner of Baseball, who is uh, the real commissioner. Thank you. Thank you, Connie Mack. And now the 12 players in the Baseball Hall of Fame, elected by the Baseball Writers Association. Wee Willie Keeler. He hit him where he ate. In his memory. Christy Matheson, baseball's big six, master of the fadeaway, and famous pitcher for the Giants. In his memory. Ty Cobb, the Georgia Peach, great base runner who holds more records than any other player in baseball. Ty Cobb was a little bit late in arriving here. We do know, however, that he was at Detroit yesterday and is on his way here to Cooperstown. We'll hear him later in the afternoon. Ty Cobb has not arrived yet, folks. He's on his way. The report we have now. And now, Hunter Swagner, the Flying Dutchman, the greatest shortstop in the game's history. And from the Hall of Museums through the large doors comes Hunter Swagner. Everybody rises to their feet, and he gets a great ovation. The old Dutchman from Pittsburgh, as he walks out, he shakes hands with the boys in the front row and out of the microphone. Shake me right on a buggy. Them days we had no automobile. Now, I'm certainly am pleased to be here at Cooperstown today, and this is just a wonderful little city, a town or village or whatever we'd call it. It puts me in mind of Sleepy Hollow. Thank you for being able to come here today. Thank you, Honor. Now, the next memorial to come before the mic is Tris Speaker, greatest defensive player of all time and a great hitter. And here he comes, ladies and gentlemen, a great eagle. He looks fit as a fiddle as though he could go out there and put his glove on and go and get him now. He's dressed in gray with his gray hair and out of the microphone. Thank you, Tilly, and uh, I guess it's good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm not going to take up a great deal of time. Connie Mack uh, really made a speech for all of us. I'm very happy indeed to have been chosen by the sports writers as a member of this great Hall of Fame. Our time is very limited, so I'm going to thank you again and let someone else come on. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Napoleon Larry Lajaway, baseball's greatest second baseman, a natural hitter, and a model of grace. Yes, sir, he used to scoop him up, overhand, underhand, on his ear, on his back, and made no difference, the old Frenchman. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm very glad to be here today and to meet all the old-timers that you probably a lot of you have watched playing baseball and some of the greatest men that ever walked on the ball field. And I am glad to have the honor to be here today and join with them. And I hope that everybody enjoys it as well as I do, because I'm certainly having a great day. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. 
511. Here he comes. The old grand got into the He wants to pitch this afternoon on that all-star ball game. He shakes hands with everybody. Now listen for his voice. Folks, I am like the other boy that preceded me. I am glad to be here today in honor of this statuary, this Hall of Fame. Glad that I was able to go through 22-odd years and do what I did and to have my name on the record. I'm very glad to be here going along throughout our land. One of the greatest games on earth, I don't think, and I do hope and wish that in a hundred years from now, the game will still be greater. I thank you very much. Thank you, Cy. Thank you very much. Walter Johnson, Steve King of the Washington Senators. And of course, ladies and gentlemen, you heard the war. Here he comes, Walter Johnson, Dustin Brown, steps up, shakes hands with Judge Mathis, and now to the microphone. Johnson, holder of the world strikeout record. Here he is. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm very proud to have my name enrolled in this Hall of Fame with these other gentlemen. I'm very happy to be with you here this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, Walter Johnson. And now, George Sissler, great first baseman and hitter, owner of the world's record for safe hits in a single season, 257. And to the platform walks George Sissler. George is dressed in a, in a light cream-colored suit. He walks immediately to Judge Landis and then over to Doyle and now his voice. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, I think I'm one of the youngsters of this Hall of Fame, but I, it certainly is nice to be back here and to greet all you gentlemen. I think it's a great thing for baseball to commemorate the uh, fine records of all these great men that have played baseball in during the time that baseball has been played. And I'm certainly glad to do my little part today in helping this great day. Thank you. Thank you, George. Eddie Collins, a ball player's ball player. Eddie Collins is dressed in gray, wearing white shoes. He walks immediately out to Judge Landis, shakes hands as they all do, and here's his voice. Tony Max, one hundred thousand dollar in field, and here's Eddie in person. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. This is about the proudest day of my life to be able to rub elbows with the players that are here today. I feel that why I'd be glad to be the bat boy for such a team as this. Certainly. A happy moment for me, and I'm most grateful to the baseball writers who have made it possible for me to be in this Hall of Fame. Thank you very much. Thank you, Eddie. Grover Cleveland Alexander, Old Pete. Remember Yankee Stadium on Old Pete? They all jump to their feet. Yes, they're up in the treetops, up on top of Billy. Old Pete takes a little longer coming in, but he walks just as he did on that long walk in Yankee Stadium when he fanned was out. Here he is. Alexander. I thank you. You know, I had many a thrill in my baseball career and many a treat, but I consider this the greatest treat and one of the biggest thrills I had in my long time in baseball. I'm proud to be a member of these gentlemen who have been here before me and will follow me up here. And in my dreams, I often think what I could do today with a team like they were, if they could be now what they were then. I would have no mistakes to be worrying about or... When they hit those line drives off me, I wouldn't have no trouble in wondering who was going to get them. I do wish to say it's a mighty proud moment in my life to be here with these gentlemen, and I wish to thank one and all very kindly. Thank you, Robert Stephen Alexander. Babe Bruce, the Bambino! How I climbed up that ovation for Babe Ruth. Everybody is standing on their feet, and here comes Babe Ruth. Babe is just in a white... Uh, Palm Beach suit, wearing a white sports shirt, rolled on at the neck, and his curly hair waving. He walks right to Mr. Doyle. Thank you, ladies. It's like an anniversary myself, because 25 years ago yesterday, I pitched my first baseball game in Boston for the Boston Red Sox. <laughs> so it seems like an anniversary for me, too, and I'm surely glad, and it's a pleasure for me to come up here and be picked also on the Hall of Fame. Thank you. Thank you, Babe Ruth. Folks, it has been my privilege today 
a privilege which I accept on behalf of the Baseball Writers Association to introduce to you the living members of Baseball Hall of Fame. And now again, we have... Ladies and gentlemen, we come now to the conclusion of one of the most elaborate and brilliant ceremonies that sportdom has ever known. Here in the slumbering little city of Cooperstown, located in upstate New York City, thousands of persons have come from the four corners of this country to be here today to rub elbows with these immortals of baseball who put on a great show. The High Commissioner of Baseball, the head of all baseball, Judge Kennesaw Martin Landis, has now declared the Museum of Baseball here in Cooperstown open to the public, a three-story building built out of brick and tile. Across the street, a brand new post office. Yes, the folks here in upstate New York in Cooperstown are mighty proud today, and they should be. A little later on this afternoon, these old-timers will go to the newly erected baseball park just one block here from the spot where Abner Doubleday invented our great national pastime. And now, in dropping out of the air, the password of the day seems to be this. Give your boy a ball and a bat with which to play, and your worries will be over that he might go astray. This program has reached you through the medium of the voice of Tom Manning, directly from Cooperstown, New York, standing on an erected platform in front of the Baseball Museum and through the National Broadcasting Company. And now, ladies and gentlemen, the game underway is underway down on the field. Mel, Mel Allen is out there ready to take it. And we're going to move our microphone position so that we can both be out on the field to tell you something about the game between the Excelsiors and the Knickerbockers. Take it away, Mel Allen. All right, Arch. Ladies and gentlemen, we're witnessing now a game which was played back in 1850. And baseball of the 1850s was really a different game. The bases were equidistant, 90 feet, and there was no more soaking of the runner or hitting of the runner, as was explained to you in the first game of town ball, which was just taken, has just taken place out here. It's still a far cry from modern baseball, though. We have a batter up at the plate now with his long side burns and whiskers. He takes a swing with the ball. He misses. Incidentally, the catcher plays almost 10 feet back of the home plate. There are no called balls or strikes, and the batter waits until he gets what he wants, and he signals for the kind of pitch he likes, and he'll wait all day until he gets that type of pitch. The batter just piles on off and moves back to keep him getting hit by the ball. But there's no balls or strikes cause we were explaining to you. And the batter can signify to the pitcher whether he wants a high or a low pitch, and the pitcher's got to put it there, otherwise the batter may stay here all day. If the ball is batted out of the field, the batter's entitled to one base. <laughs> and you know how the base look if it's like that. There's a ground ball going down to first base, and the infielder picks the ball up, soaks the runner with it, and there's a great argument taking place. We're going to see if we can't get down there to see what's going on, because as you know, when baseball first started as a town game, that's the way the runners were put out. They were soaked with the ball. Well, this infielder just took the batter's grounder and soaked him with it, but we're playing 1850 baseball now, and you're not allowed to do that, so the umpires run all the way down to first base and has called the runners safe. So we have a runner on first base, the batter taking his place in the batter's box. At first, he steps out, bows very low to the assembled gathering, takes his place up at the plate, signals for the pitch he wants. Here it comes, underhand delivery, strikes, and he misses. Pitcher stands up there with his arms folded, waiting for the batter to give him the signal. He gets it. Batter signals for a letter-high pitch. Here it comes. The batter swings, and he files it off. Incidentally, a man can be put out in this game 
by catching a fly ball in his cap for a put out. Of course, none of the players have gloves or mitts. There goes the grounder down to shortstop. The shortstop misses it, goes out to center field. He fumbles the ball momentarily, picks it up, throws in to second. The batter is safe at first. Throws the runner going from first end to second. And we have men on first and second now for the Knickerbocker, or rather the Excelsior team, which is now batting. There goes a drive. Far out into center field, the fielder takes it in his hands, and the side is retired. That's three outs, no run scored. But to get on with some description of the game, incidentally, the umpire has just hollered, chain sides. He's dressed in a frock-tailed coat with a high silk hat, a red umbrella in his hand, which he used as occasion to protect himself from the sun. He also has a cane in his hand and a couple of balls, extra balls, to be used in this game. He's really tied up. We're going into the second inning of this game between the Knickerbockers and Excelsiors, depicting how baseball was played in 1850, nothing, nothing. The batter hits a pop fly, which the pitcher takes for the first out. I want to tell you something about the players now. They're dressed. They're generously supplied with handlebar mustaches, sideburns, and even beards, although they have no gloves or mitts. The uniforms are very colorful, tending toward long trousers, long sleeve shirts, and gaudy caps. The batter's up. Strike one. The umpire calls. I'm going to move over here and let you hear this umpire call him. Moving over there, the batter hits the ground ball to the pitcher. The pitcher turns around, throws him out at first. First baseman pumps it, picks it up, and he's out. The umpire calls him out. We're over here behind the umpire now. We're going to let you hear him. And today, if you may have heard the umpire say, striker, which means for the batter to take his place in the box. That's what the batter was called in 1850, striker. Did you hear that, ladies and gentlemen? The umpire calling it. The umpire incidentally standing off to the right of the catcher, not behind the plate as modern day umpires do. Two strikes, it's called. Here comes the pitch. The striker didn't offer at it. Now the striker is protesting to the umpire that the pitcher is not tossing the ball into him where he's calling for it. Did you hear the umpire? He told the pitcher to spit pitch to the point where the striker wants the ball. Here comes the next pitch, still not where he wants it. The umpire looks around to see if everything's all set. He started tossing a new ball, but the catcher went over to retrieve the one that he missed. Now we're ready to go once again. The batter's still waiting for the kind of pitch he wants. Here he comes, a swing. Did you hear that? The striker is out, three outs, and again the side is returned. The first half of the second inning. The Knickerbockers were retired, so they have no score. They're going out to the field. The Excelsiors come up to take their turn at bat. We're in the last half of the second inning of this ball game, depicting how baseball was played in 1850. No score as yet. Again, the umpire calls for the striker. Did you hear the umpire? He called one strike as the batter missed it entirely. Here comes the next pitch. Foul ball back over the catcher's head. Catcher comes over and just grabs the ball out of the umpire's hands without even asking him for it. Here comes the next pitch. A high fly going deep in the left field is curving foul. This left field is going after it. It goes into the stands, and the umpire calls it. He's out of bounds! He says it's out of bounds. The runner coming back from his position at first base. It was a foul ball. Batter picks up his bat, steps into the batter's box, signals that he wants to pitch waist high. Here it comes. It's wide. Again, the batter signals to the pitcher where he wants the ball. Here it comes again. He swings. Right. Waiting for the umpire to call his decision on that. Two strikes, he says. There's another foul ball. Oh, come on, come on, come on. Two strikes on the batter. We're playing in the last half of the second inning of the game between the Knickerbockers and the Excelsiors. Again, the umpire tosses another ball in as the foul comes back. Here's the next pitch, a long fly going out into deep left field. Again, curving foul. The yeah, fielder goes over and takes it for the put out. Now, Arch McDonald is down on the field at this point. Can't spot him just yet, but I'm sure he's down here somewhere. Arch, can you hear me? And now, the Excelsiors are at the bat. Knickerbockers in the field, and the first hitter hits one out to center field. He is known as the striker. It's going over the center field's head. He rounds first base, and it is caught on the first bounce, and therefore the striker is out. The umpire announces the striker is out, and the floor will pitch to the next striker. He calls for a high pitch, and it's too high, so he doesn't bother to go with it. Calls for another one there. 
This time he hits it. It's a high fly ball. Pop fly out there to the third baseman. And the pitcher runs in front of him and knocks the third baseman down and finally gets it. And the umpire says, three hands are out, gentlemen, chain sags. And out there, they are now posing in the center of the diamond. And the umpire will lead the march down to home plate. The two teams are standing there, arms of Kimbo on their chest, and the umpire is standing in between them out there at the pitcher's box. He is now making a talk. He bows. All of the two teams bow. And the umpire, Fox Coat, umbrella and all, is cutting off the field. And very shortly, we're going to get underway with the real game. Here is a present-day baseball star who I believe has been enjoying this. Hank Greenberg, home run slugger of the Detroit Tigers, is here, one of the many celebrated baseball stars. And, Hank, what is your impression of what you've seen so far of baseball as was played 100 years ago? Oh, uh, this is a thrill being up here today, Arch. Uh, watching these uh, players who played 100 years ago, the game certainly has changed. Well, how would you like to be able to cross that pitch you wanted, Hank? It would be kind of nice to be able to cross for a low or high ball on it. Well, it might have been more than 58 last year if you could do that. It might have been that. Well, thanks very much, Hank. I uh, hope you have a nice time today. And I appreciate you coming up quite a bit. Thank you, Hodge. Right. And now, ladies and gentlemen, here's another member of the Hall of Fame. Wally Johnson, the man about whom it was said, you can't hit him when you don't see him. Here's Wally Johnson. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Well, we're having a great time up here in Cooperstown this afternoon. It's great to see the improvements made in baseball right from the start 100 years ago. And, uh, of course, I'm very proud to have my name uh, enlisted up here with these other men in the Hall of Fame. And it's been a great day, as I said, all around. I'm very happy to have been up here. Thank you very much, Walter Johnson. And now back to Mel Allen. Thank you very much, Arch. Ladies and gentlemen, I have the modern-day baseball star, too, standing just to my right. As a matter of fact, one of the greatest stars of modern-day baseball. It's a great pleasure to introduce him to you, none other than Jerome Herman Dizzy Dean. Diz, I want to ask you, what do you think of baseball as it was played back in 1839 and 1850 as compared with modern-day baseball? Well, there's a lot of difference, but I want to say first that I think all of those older ball players that made it possible for young, us players to play this kind of baseball today. They made it possible for us fellas to come along and uh, make big money out of the game. And uh, my remembrance will always be towards those fellas who made it possible for us young fellas to start in today to play baseball. Well, thank you very much, Diz. Are you enjoying the festivities this afternoon? Oh, it certainly is. It looks like a world series. The score tied nothing to nothing in the ninth inning. <laughs> well, you ought to know. You've been in plenty of them. Thank you very, very much, Dizzy Dean. See you again. And now back to Arch McDonald. Directly in back of us, ladies and gentlemen, Hans Wagner, representing the National League, and Eddie Collins, representing the American League, have just taken a bat. And in the way that you and I and all of us baseball fans have done so many times as kids, they have thrown the bat one from the other and then brought the fist up the line on the bat, choosing up. They are choosing two ball clubs, and for the first time in baseball history, here at Doubleday Field in Cooperstown, New York, this afternoon, American Leaguers and National Leaguers will be playing side by side on the team, same team. We've seen World Series, we've seen All-Star games, but here this afternoon we're going to have National Leaguers and American Leaguers playing side by side. You may see an American Leaguer at first base, a National Leaguer at second, an American Leaguer pitching, National Leaguer playing short on the same team. In other words, these two great immortals of baseball, both of whom are in the Hall of Fame, picked up the bat, threw to each other, and they made their choices, and we'll have men from both leagues lined up on the two opposing teams. This game's going to get underway very shortly, and here comes Honus Wagner, famous immortal of the Pittsburgh Pirates. Tell us something about your team this afternoon, the one you've chosen, Hans. Well, the team that I've chosen, I, I'd just say any team that's choosing here this afternoon, I'll give anybody the first pick and I'll take what's left. Now, chances are I'll still beat them. <laughs> but what's left? All right, Hans, thank you very much. And now for a word from the opposing manager, Eddie Collins, another member of the Hall of Fame and general business manager of the Boston Red Sox. What is your plan of attack this afternoon, Eddie? Well, I guess we're going to not spare the horses. Everybody's going to clout, I hope. The only regret that we have, these old-timers, is that we can't have a part of it ourselves. 
Cubs were having the biggest kick out of this day of any day of ever been in baseball. I bet you feel young and you have in well, 30, 40 years. Anytime huh? I can rub elbows with these guys or around the ball field, I'm always going to feel young. Brother, you said it. All right, thank you very much, Eddie Collins. We just talked to both opposing managers, Eddie Collins and Hans Wagner, and I think Mel Ott is ready now with someone else that you radio people, uh, you listeners, ought to meet. All right, Mel. Thank you very much, Arch, for calling me Mel Ott, but <laughs> I wish I were. Anyway, ladies and gentlemen, I have standing here a young lad who last year really made baseball history. He was chosen to come out here this afternoon to participate in the cavalcade of baseball ceremonies. I'd like to present him to you now. It's that man who tossed two successive no-hit baseball games last year. And you know I'm talking about Johnny Double-Hit Vandermeer of the Cincinnati Reds at South Park Pitching Demon. Johnny, what do you think of everything out here today? Well, it's, uh, I just think it's going to be a big affair as it really is here. And uh, I don't think the, the only place you can sit on this place now probably is on the base. <laughs> well, look, Johnny, what are you going to do? Well, I expect to work an inning or two. I don't know just how many games they're going to play, whether it's going to be three or seven. I haven't heard myself. Well, uh, of course, I don't mean to embarrass you here, Johnny, but what, you got right shoes on. Wear those spikes. <laughs> well, I mean, it's frayed and can't walk in spikes. Oh, you frayed it, but I've been through the grounds from the street. I thought perhaps you frayed it from back to the grandstand. No, we ain't frayed it. Well, what do you think of the baseball as it was played in 1850, Johnny? Well, uh, I'd probably get a base with myself if I could uh, tell a pitcher how to throw it. <laughs> if you could wait all day. Well, how would you like to be pitching in modern-day baseball with the rule that the batter didn't have to take the ball unless he liked it and there were no balls and strikes called? Well, there's no ball and strikes called. As long as no balls called, I'd probably do pretty good. I know, but you probably have to pitch all afternoon when it gets pretty tiring after a while. Well, I'll have to throw in the hand. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very, very, very much, Johnny Vandermeer. And now, ladies and gentlemen, this ball game is going to get underway in just a very, very few minutes. Ball players are warming up. There's Mallott warming up with the old veteran Tris Speaker who's in the Hall of Fame. Daisy Dean is out to Mallott's right, warming up a bit with Mo Berg, the erudite catcher of the Boston Red Sox. Over to my left is Lefty Grove. He's warming up. There's Hank Greenberg. Oh, they're just stars galore all about us. And now I'm going to switch back over to Arch McDonald, who probably has found out what the starting lineups are going to be this afternoon, and we'll see if he has any information on that point. Arch? Ladies and gentlemen, the Major League game is about to get underway, and I see Jack Slocum coming over here with one of the grand old men of baseball. Bill Clem was here as one of the umpires this afternoon. You've all heard his name. You know him as one of the most fearless men that ever donned an umpire's tool and one of the most capable umpires that ever lived. Bill, what do you think of this thing up here at Cooperstown today? Folks, this is the greatest affair of, any, of, of its kind that I've ever experienced in all my life. I have ac actually had to shed tears on several occasions. And to explain it hard over the mic is hard. You would, must be here to see this wonderful spectacle for the great honor on this particular day. Thank you very much, Bill Flem. I know it was not too easy for you to talk. And now the big leaguers are warming up. The all-star teams will get underway in a moment. And here is Mel Allen with someone else to talk to you. Standing by me here now, ladies and gentlemen, is one of the greatest second basemen of modern-day baseball. I don't think any more need be said. I might add, though, just as I said that, that a previous great second baseman just passed us by as I spoke, and that was Eddie Collins, who is in the Baseball Hall of Fame. But the man I'm talking about now is a great second baseman from the Detroit Tigers, Charlie Geringer, who's warming up with Cookie Labajato of the Brooklyn Dodgers. And, Charlie, if you'll hold this ball now, the cookie's just tossed you. I want to ask you to say a few words to our audience. Give us your impression of the ceremonies here this afternoon. Well, greetings, fans, from Cooperstown. It really is a very impressive ceremony we're going through this afternoon. Cookie. And it's very fitting for the great game of baseball. Well, thank you very much, Charlie. What's Wagner's team? Oh, well, I don't know. It's kind of on. <laughs> you look very happy about it all, though. Think well, you have a good time today? I mean, no pressure on, you know. It's a uh, pleasure to be here today. I... Quite a thrill. 
Well, thank you very much, Cookie. I know it is a thrill to be out here at this. It is really a thrilling day. Thanks a lot, Cookie. And now, back to Arch McDonald. And for a moment, ladies and gentlemen, we pause for station identification. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. You need to go ahead, will you? WABC, New York. You need to go ahead, will you? WABC, New York. Ladies and gentlemen, you heard the voice of one of the umpires this afternoon, Bill Clem of the National League. It's a pleasure to introduce at this time the other gentleman who will umpire representing the American League. He has played with many of these ball players, both in uniform and some of them who are now members of the Hall of Fame. You all remember Eddie Rommel, great knuckleballer of the Philadelphia Athletics of other days, and he's here representing the American League as an umpire this afternoon. How do you like this beautiful sight today, Eddie? Well, it's quite surprising to know that to come to a small town like this with so many people, I'd love to know where they all live in a small town like this. But I imagine they're from out of town, the mo most of them. But it certainly is wonderful if the people on the outside could only see this crowd here, they really would appreciate what baseball is. You bet your life, Eddie. And for your information, Cooperstown is a town of around 2,700 people. And we have probably 17,000 here. Every seat is filled. The people are standing all around. And I'm sure if there was room for more, that they're outside the gates and would like to get in. And now I'd like to give the radio audience the lineups for the Major League game. And as I told you, this is the first time the American and National Leaguers have been playing side by side as members of the same team. So if any of you listening in would like to keep score, here are the lineups for the two teams. The Hans Wagner team, Moses, M-O-S-E-S, -S, center field. That's why Moses of Philadelphia. Batting second is Archie Vaughn, shortstop of the Pittsburgh Pirates. At second base, Charlie Geringer, second baseman of the Detroit Tigers. Playing right field and batting fourth, the famous Ducky, Rocky, Joe Medwick of the St. Louis Cardinals. Batting fifth and catching, Mo Berg of the Boston Red Sox. Batting sixth and playing left field is Molly Arnovich, A-R-N-O-V-I-C-H, left field of the Philadelphia Phillies. The catcher, batting seventh, is Jimmy Wilson of the Cincinnati Reds. The third baseman, who will bat eight, Marvin Owen. Marvin Owen is batting eight, Chicago White Sox third baseman. And the pitcher, Lefty Grove, none other. Eddie Collins' team, Lloyd Wainer, Little Poison Wainer, playing center field and leading off. He will be followed by Bill Herman, captain of the Cubs, playing second base and batting second. Mal Ott, great little outfielder of the New York Giants, is playing left field and batting third. Hank Greenberg of the Detroit Tigers, the gentleman who hit 58 home runs last year to come to within two of Bay Booth's famous 1927 record is batting fourth, playing first base. He is followed by George Selkirk, playing right field and batting fifth. The catcher for the Collins team is Arnt Jorgens of the world's champion New York Yankees. Stanley Hack of the Chicago Cubs is playing third base and batting seventh. Cecil Chavez, great shortstop of the Washington Senators, is batting eighth, playing short. And the pitcher, Dizzy Dean. Where else in all baseball could you combine two lineups that could start a ball game as sparkling as these two, containing the names of all the present day stars of the greatest game of them all? And this game's going to get underway. There will be numerous substitutions. Each club has sent approximately 16, each league has sent approximately 16 men up here, and now we're going to walk up here and try to get the word on the ground rules. That's two bases. If it's hit into the, any part of those stands. Any part of the stands, yeah. two bases. 
On the hip ball. On the hip ball. How about the chrome ball, Bill? Chrome ball that goes into the crowd is also two bases. Also two bases. A pitch ball off of the mound that goes into the dugout or in that opening or back of the at the stand. That's one base. That's about the only ground. That's about the only ground. You all sit over the crowd, the home run. Over the crowd. Must be over the crowd and move around the field. In either field, any ball hit over the crowd is a home run. Otherwise, any ball that goes in the crowd is two bases. I see. Well, it's bouncing in there or otherwise. Bouncing or otherwise. Two bases. All right. Those are considered the uh, back to consider the bench. I see. As in. All right. Thank you, everyone. And thank you, Bill Clem. Now we're going to get this game underway in a few moments, ladies and gentlemen. The men are out here warming up. Approximately two men from each major league club. Some of them have three or four. Some of them have one. It might be well to glance over some of the names that are here for the two major leagues. The Giants have sent Mel Ott and Jurgis, Bill Jurgis up here. Al Schumacher and Carl Hubble are here, but not in uniform. The Cubs have sent Davey Dean, Bill Heyman, Stanley Huck, and Bobby Hartnett. The Reds have Vandermeer here. Somebody who was supposed to come was not yet in uniform. Maybe can carry more from the Cardinals. I see Deacon, Danny McFadden from the Bees, Lavagetto from the Dodgers, and Steinbach also from Brooklyn, Lloyd Rayner and Archie Vaughn from the Pirates, Marianovich from the Phillies, some of the American Leaguers, the St. Louis Browns have sent Rupert Thompson, Washington Senators have sent Clark Wright, hard trucking outfielder, and Cecil Chavez, the shortstop, and will start the game. The Tigers have sent Charlie Gander and Hank Greenberg. The Yankees have sent on Jorgens, the catcher, and George Sarko, the outfielder. The Rays have sent Frank Hayes, the catcher. Wally Mills is the outfield. We were told that Bob Johnson should be here shortly and probably will. Allen and Schilling, Johnny Allen and Jimmy Schilling are here from the Cleveland Indians. And from Red Sox, left the Grove, who start the game as one of the pitchers in Moldberg. And the White Sox have sent Muddy Rear and Marvin Owen. The old Johnson is up there at the plate now. He has the number 14. He is not on either team. But in just a moment, I think Mel Anna will be ready to bring you some very important information. All right, man. Thank you, Arch. Ladies and gentlemen, this is one of the greatest thrills I've ever had since I've been in radio, to be very frank with you. Because standing to my right is a man who was one of my idols when I was in the pants, so to speak. That doesn't make him so very old, because I'm not so very old. But the man I'm talking about is a member of the Hall of Fame, one of the greatest baseball players that has ever lived. None other than the Georgia Peach Ty Cobb. Mr. Cobb, would you say a few words to our radio audience, please? Uh, ladies and gentlemen, there isn't much that I can say except that I feel very much honored and very happy to be here this day. Uh, one of baseball, baseball's most eventful day. Uh, well, there's a great many notables here, and uh, it's very interesting to meet lots of old friends and be here on uh, this dedication to uh, the Hall of Fame. Thank you. I suppose that's all I can say. Well, Mr. Cobb, uh, in speaking of the Hall of Fame, we reported to our radio audience the ceremonies that took place at that point, and we were forced to mention that you were somewhat late when everybody, the entire crowd there, was wondering why it was that you were tardy. Well, I, I came into Utica this morning and uh, with my son and daughter, and uh, I, I got a little mixed up on the time of the different events, and so we took our time coming over by auto from uh, Utica and arrived here just a few minutes late, but I, I, I think I'd have been there on time if I had known uh, that I'd come straight to the uh, Hall of Fame instead of looking for a hotel. Well, we're very happy that you got here anyway. And now I want to ask you this question. While you were seated up in the stands watching baseball as it was played and when it was first started in 1839 as time ball and then again in 1850, I wonder what thoughts ran through your mind as you thought of the years that you spent in modern-day baseball as compared with the baseball that you saw played so far this afternoon. Well, I'll say one thing, those boys that are out there giving us a demonstration of how the old 
time players played, I, I tell you, they're pretty good. <laughs> and uh, I think they were just about as clever in their day as we, uh, we might have been in our day. Well, and now before you go, I know you want to get back. I understand you're playing pretty good golf these days. How's your game? Well, do you want to make a game with me, or do you want to know from me how I'm playing? I want to know from you how you're playing. I'm well, playing. <laughs> I... I'm playing pretty good, but if you want to get a game with me, well, I'm playing terrible, and I want a handicap. <laughs> All right, sir. Thank you very, very much, Ty Cobb. And now we're going to switch you back over to Arch McDonald, who's over on the far side of the field as we're getting ready to go in this ball game. All right, Arch? There's been a change in the lineup, and the lineup that we gave you is essentially the same, but the players have been moved around somewhat. Joe Medwick commenced to play in right field, has now moved over to left, for the Wagner team. Uh, Larry Moses is playing out in right field. They're all batting in the same positions we gave you. And Arnovich is playing in center field. So it's Ducky Midwich, left fielder, St. Louis Cardinals, is in left. Arnovich for the Phillies is in center. And Larry Moses, the Athletics, is in right. Jimmy Wilson is going to play at first base. And the catcher is Bill Berg for the Wagner team. They're now out there. And Wally Johnson, famous fastball pitcher of the Washington Senators, is out there batting to the infield. Bill Berg is up there catching. They're throwing the ball around, and the game's going to get underway in a few moments. And if the original lineup announced by the Collins team has not been changed, the first batter will be Lloyd Green of the center field. Pippi Lavagetto, Ray Dodgers, has been out there batting the ball around, and now Wally is hitting a few balls to the outfield. Hans Wagner coming in from the dugout over here. This game will get underway in a minute. Left to Grove is warming up out there on the left. He's going to pitch for the Hans Wagner team. His catcher will be more big. And for the Eddie Collins team, Dizzy Dean will pitch a National Leaguer. And the catcher will be Arndt Jorgens, an American Leaguer. Here are just about every star in the major league. That is, they're all represented here this afternoon. Although they're not all here, I know they would all like to be here if they could see this inspiring crowd that certainly has packed this park with every available seat filled and with four bands in and around the outfield and with every seat filled and people standing all over the place. As a matter of fact, even in front of the two opposing dugouts, we find it hard to find a spot to march around with this microphone so that we can tell you about the games as it gets underway. We're not going to try to be too serious about this ball game. It doesn't mean a thing to either team except that the old ball players urge the urge of every ball players to win every game that he's in. That's what has made baseball the great game that it is and the team the eminence that it has over its 100 years of history. That's why people say anything can happen in baseball and that's why even when the ball club is behind, the people stay in the stands because too many times they have seen that famous ninth inning rally when a team obviously badly beaten has come from behind, brought thousands of cheering fans to their feet, and made them want to come out and see baseball again. Every great name in the game is here, at least most of them. All of the executives from both leagues are here, the presidents of all the clubs, the managers of all the clubs, the commissioner of baseball, the presidents of the leagues, postmaster general of the United States, all are here to watch baseball as it was played 100 years ago, which we have already seen and told you about, and baseball as it is played in the season of 1939. The photographers representing practically every news service in the United States on paper are here, and there must be at least 50 or 60 of them right near us here. All of the famous newspaper men of the nation are on hand, and you'll read their thrilling stories about this gala event here at Cooperstown at Double Bay Field in tonight's and tomorrow's papers. And in just a moment, we're going to see a good ball game get underway when, for the first time, the American and National Leaguers will be playing side by side. Well, it's Johnson hitting the ball out there now to the infield. He's just kick one out there to Marvin Horn, playing third base. The ball is being thrown all around, and now the other team is taking the field. And there goes Hank Greenberg to first base. Out there on second base is Bill Herman of the National League. That shortstop for that team is Cecil Travis of the Senators. Out there on third base for that team is Stanley Huff of the Cubs. The outfielders are Lord Rainey and George Selkirk and Mel Ott. Let's take a look and see if those outfielders are in the position that we gave you in the batting order. 
Now let's take a look and see who is out in left field. It's Marriott out in left field. There's Lloyd Zaney out in center field. And George Selkirk of the Yankees out in right field. I think Marriott is ready now with some more information that I'm sure you want to listen to. All right, come in now. Hey, all right. Yeah. In as much as we are going to have a lot of fun out here this afternoon because none of the pressure is on or anything, before we go any further, I'd like to acknowledge that it's the second time this afternoon that I'm not my lot. He's not in the field. You know, I suppose the giant ball games in New York uh, when they're at home, and uh, he's so accustomed to talking about my lot that uh, he gets me a little bit confused. And I'll admit I was a pretty good baseball player in my day, Arch. They didn't admit it. I've seen that. I know the Seriously, though, uh, Arch, don't you think that's a great picture over here in this dugout, over in Eddie Collins' dugout, to see Tris Speaker and Ty Cobb sitting together? And I'll bet a dollar to a donut that they're talking over old times when Tris was with Cleveland and Ty with Detroit. They're, talk, they're probably talking about that time when they hit and run, they should have done it or something. <laughs> they're having a great time over there. I'd like to have seen Ty out there in uniform this afternoon. And incidentally, that's George Sisler. Another member of the Hall of Fame sitting over there dying. All 11 living members of the Hall of Fame were introduced this morning at the ceremonies, and those two who have passed on, Lee Willie Keeler and the great Christy Matson, were honored as tops were blown out there this morning. George got on that St. Louis Brown uniform, too, you know, he oh, really played with. He still has on that great old uniform out there. He remembers the time the Browns came very, very close to winning that pennant in the American League. I know George Sister remembers that very well. But I don't know how many innings they're going to play out here. They're supposed to play three. Our air time will not permit, I'm sure, the broadcasting of the three innings. But there's some possibility that we'll be able to bring you uh, an inning and a half or two innings of it. Say, so there's us quite a side up there directly in front of us in the grandstand. Right? Right, Arch. Look at those two birds up there. Last time I saw them together was at the Polo Grounds the other day, and they were arguing their heads off with each other. I see they were shaking their fingers in each other's face, and there he is, <laughs> Gabby Hartman and Bill Terry side by side. <laughs> they look very natty, too. Bill in his uh, uh, Panama hat and... Oh, he's a dude. That Terry's a dude. Well, how about that? How that hat band on Hartman? Yeah, that red <laughs> thing, it looked all right. <laughs> You must be a pleasure for them sitting up there, not worried about the ball game or anything. That's right, and they, and they don't know we're talking about them, so they can't talk back. That's one thing. They can talk back to an umpire, but not to us right now. See, I looked at you as if he knew you were saying something about it. Yeah. <laughs> it looks like, well, it looks like the game's going to get underway here in the moment. Mo Berg has on the tools and back of the plate. He's catching out there, you know, this afternoon, catching for Hans Wagner's team. And there goes that great left-hander, Robert Moses Grove from Lonacone, Maryland, is going out there to pitch. He's out there now, gets himself a little bit of the rising bag. No bird shaking hands with Bill Clem, the great umpire for the National League. Hans Wagner's out there, Eddie Wander, who will umpire representing the American League, is out there, and so far the infielders have not gone out. But they will be out in a moment. All of the town ball players, the Nickelbacker team, the Excelsior team, are now all at the field. And in a way, as soon as the newsreel men get their pictures, while the two teams will pose for pictures, and then the game will actually get underway. Right. There goes Joe Medley. Go ahead, man. I just say, I'm going to move down back to third baseline. You stay over there back at home play and look out for those final balls. Well, you better watch out. A lot of right-handed hitters in there today. <laughs> okay, Hank. Greenberg tried to skip a little rope as he jumped over a microphone wire there, but he got over it safely. I presume he's still on. And now there they go to the infield and outfield. The Hans Wagner team will be out there on the first team to hit the visiting club, in other words, this afternoon, is Eddie Collins' team of great ball players representing both leagues. If the lineup does not change, Lloyd Rainer will be the first batter. Great outfielder for the, for the Pittsburgh Pirates, who's been such a great credit to this national game for so long, will be the first man up. Left-handed pitcher facing the left-handed batter, and left his leg is warming up. Now Allen is building his way over there, I believe, to the Hall of Fame dugout somewhere, but I can't see him at the moment. All right, I just dropped over here to get me a drink of this ice cold water. And oh, I see. Well, don't tell me about it. <laughs> <laughs> Lefty Grove is warming up. Mo Berg is catching. I gave you the batting order. I went over it hurriedly. Moses in center field. Vaughn at shortstop. Gehringer second base. 
Medwick in left, Moorboard catching, Arnovich in center, Wilson playing first base, Owen third, and Grove pitching. They're out there in the field now, and now at the plate, Lloyd Rayner digs in. With a left-handed hitter, Pittsburgh Pirates. Bill Clem is ready behind the plate, and first play ball, Moe's winds up. Here's the first pitch, and it's inside. They slope curve the field break far enough, one ball count. Rayner just laughs. No pressure is on out here this afternoon. The boys can have a lot of fun. Lefty starts his wind up again. Here it comes, and there it goes, a slow hit ball out to the second baseman. Geringer picks it up, the throw to first is good, and he's out. Geringer to Jimmy Wilson, second to first, or out number one of this ball game. Next batter is Billy Herman, captain of the Cubs, a right-handed hitter. Marvin Owen plays over a little close to the line now. Archie Vaughan's playing him deep, back on the edge of the grass. Moore's winds up. Here's the pitch, and there it goes, out to the shortstop on two hops. He picks it up, throw to Wilson, is good. And he gets him just by an eyelash for the second out. Herman hitting the first pitch and grounding out. Short to first, Archie Vaughn to Jimmy West. Archie made a nice pickup of that, didn't he, Archie? Yeah, he did. Nice throw from deep short Here's shot. Here's Mel Ott, number four. Outfield of the Giants. And left field, left-handed hitter. Here's the wind up. Here it comes, and he hits the first pitch. Out to shortstop. It's good for a moment. Vaughn picks it up close to first. And he is safe as the ball gets by Wilson. That ball is hit right back through the box. Vaughn went back over second, juggled it for a moment. Ott went down there, and there is an error. The ball went through, and Ott goes to second. You remember Bill Quinn told you that on a thrown ball into the crowd, the hitter got one base. Here's Hank Greenberg up, no stretches. Here's the pitch to Hank. He hit the slow roller down the line, tops it. Owen comes in fast, throws the first, and he's off the bag. Wilson is off the bag, and Greenberg is safe, Ott pulling up on third. The ball is tapped down the third baseline by Greenberg. Owen made the play all right, but he pulls Jimmy Wilson off the bag. Greenberg is safe. And here's George Selkirk at the play. There's the first pitch in its inside. Ball one. Change of pace. Selkirk has changed teams. No, he hasn't. He's in the right spot. Moe's takes a look at first. Here's the next pitch, Selkirk hits it down the line, two hops to Wilson, he steps on first, and the side is retired, Selkirk rounding out to Jimmy Wilson, unassisted at first base. Side is retired with no runs, two men left on base, one error. Mallott come in on the other side there when you get ready for this other club to come up. All right, right Mallott, Allen. <laughs> All right. All right, thank you very much. You know, in that half inning, I was very much interested in looking over into the Honus Wagner team dugout when Hank Greenberg came to the plate. Because sitting over there in the dugout was Babe Ruth. And as Hank came up to the plate, the old home run hitter of the American League, I couldn't help but think that there were a lot of thoughts running through the mind of the Babe, thinking back to the days when he was swapping them far and wide over the fences of the American League. Now we're ready to go here in the... Last half of this first inning, Dizzy Dean's on the mound for the Collins team. He's taking his warm-up pitches, the infield tossing the ball around. There's Hank Greenberg over there on first base. Billy Herman on second, Stan Hack on third, and Cecil Travis on shortstop. Coming up to the plate, first batter is Wally Moses of Philadelphia. Wally Moses of Philadelphia A's. Dills Dixon there gets his signal, takes his wind up. Here's the pitch. There's a ground ball going down to Hank Greenberg at first. Hank picks it up, tosses it over to Dizzy. Dizzy steps on the bag, and Moses is out. Very nice play, a ground ball. It's Moses' draw on the very first pitch down to Hank Greenberg. Hank fielded it nicely. He's too far off the bag to make the play himself. And Diz, ever alert, is over there. Took the toss from Greenberg, and one man is away. Up comes Archie Vaughn. Drops out to Pittsburgh Pirates. Dills takes his wind up. Here's the pitch. Foul ball. A line drive. It's curved foul in right field. Over the right field foul line. The first pitch in there, which Vaughn liked. He really leaned on it, but there went foul. One strike. No balls in Archie Vaughn. Second man up for the Wagner team. Here's the pitch. A slow ball in the outside corner of the plate. Ball one. It was called on by Bill Tim. One and one's the count on Archie Vaughn. Diz looks in there, getting his signal from Moberg, the catcher. Here's the wind-up. Here's the pitch, another slow one on the outside corner. Outside to a left-handed hitter. 
Two balls, one strike on Archie Bond. We're playing in the last half of the first inning of this game between the Wagners and the Collinses. Here's the pitch. Again on the outside corner. Three balls, one strike. Old Biz's control is not so good right now. Biz's control usually goes pretty good. Here comes the next pitch. It's swung on. The ground is going down to second base. Herman picks it up, throws over to Greenberg, and Bond is out. Out number two. Two outs, two away, nobody on. And up to the plate steps Charlie Geringer. Charlie Geringer, second baseman of the Detroit Tigers. And he gets a nice round of applause from the assembled throng. Two away, nobody on. Here's the first pitch from Biz Dean. Strike one, it's called. Strike one right in there. One strike, no balls on Charlie Geringer. Biz standing on the rubber, gets his signal. Here comes the pitch. Geringer leans on one. Taken on the first half by Billy Herman, he tosses to Hank Greenberg, but the third out, the side is retired. No runs, no hits, and no errors. All right, Arch, as we go into the second inning of this ball game between the Wagners and the Collinses, nothing and nothing, We're getting ready to go into the second inning, so take it away, Arch McDonald. We may have a change in pitchers at the end of this inning. However, chances are we won't be on the air at that time, and I'll tell you now, though, that the next two pitchers will be Deacon Green and Faden from the best of Bees, and Johnny Vandermeer and the new Green in Cincinnati Hill. They're both warming up out there, and they will relieve Lefty Gray and Dizzy Dean. Gray was back on the mound now for the second inning. There's nothing and nothing, and I might say that this is their third baseball out here so far. Even with this press being a very small one, with the crowds packed all around, the entire ball park was now surrounded with people. Temporary stands are in left left center, right center, and right field. So the entire ballpark right now is a horseshoe here at Better Day Field in Cooperstown, New York. Every available seat is filled. The people are standing, and balls within the crowd will be two, ba- two bases, but so far we've had none. Real World Series baseball. There's Aunt Jordan's, catcher for the Yankees, up facing left field as well. These two have met before. Here's a long wind up. And the pitch from left field, and it's strike one call right down the middle. One strike on Art Jorgens, a right-handed hitter, first man up the second, score nothing and nothing. Well, gets the signal, starts to slow, wind up. Here's the pitch, and he swings and fouls it back, going back to Bill Clinton, back on that form here. Count is two strikes. Boberg down on his haunches behind the plate. Lucky he go, grab the glass off the new ball that is thrown out. Goes on his pitching hand for a moment, steps on, gets the signal, starts to slow, wind up. Here it comes, and there it goes. A high pop fly out to the shortstop. Vaughn back there, only to easily back on the grass, and he takes it for the first out. That's one more out. Joe Jorgens popped out to Vaughn at shortstop. Next better up is Stanley Hatch. Third baseman of the Chicago Cubs. Champions of the National League, left-handed here. Gold is ready. Here it comes, and he swings and fouls it in the bird's foot, and it's one strike on Stanley Hack. One out, nobody on, second inning, no score in this ball game. The challenge team is at back. Rogue's ready, here's the wind up, out to straight away. The pitch is low and outside, and it's one and one. One ball, one strike. One out and one on. Rogue takes a look down at his body mate, Mo Berg of the Red Sox. Start to slow, wind up. Trivets. Then he throws on the strike two call. Change of pace just dropped in the slot there. One and two now, one ball and two strikes, one out and none on. First half the second inning. Scores dead left with nothing and nothing at this point. Here's the next pitch. It's a slow roller going down there with Owen going over. He can't get it. Vaughn takes it, throws to first, and he's out. On a fine throw by Archie Vaughn, the pitch break ball at shortstop. Owen went far to his left, tried to spear the ball, missed it, and Vaughn came up with it. The throw was good to Jimmy Wilson, and that's two men out. Cecil Chavez, shortstop of the Washington Senators, another left-handed hitter is up. He threw his face, drove many times, and Dave starts to wind up now. Berg straightens up. There's the pitch to Chavez, who hits one down, two hops out there to Geringer. Geringer to Wilson on the side of the tiger ladder. No runs, no hits, no errors. Nobody left to score at the end of the first half of the second inning. Nothing and nothing. Take it now. All right, Arch. Ladies and gentlemen, Time flies by rather rapidly, and we've got to leave this ball game after one and a half innings of play in which neither team could score either the Wagners or the Collinses. This afternoon, we come up to Cooperstown, New York, the birthplace of baseball, the great national pastime, 
where we have witnessed and described for you some of the ceremonies attendant upon the centennial celebration of baseball. As you know, baseball is in its 100th year this season. There's been a great deal of color pageantry depicting the progress of baseball, starting out with time ball as it was played back in 1839, Going on from there to 1850, when Admiral Doubleday first invented baseball. We witnessed teams depicting how these two games were played, and then we came on to modern baseball, wherein the two sides composed of the National American League stars are now playing, giving the fans a sample of modern day big league baseball. And so it's been the pleasure of yours truly, Mel Allen and Arch McDonald, to bring to you a portion of the centennial celebration of baseball from Cooperstown, New York. Goodbye.